Hey, anatomy and physiology people. Welcome to the second lecture on cells and membranes and transport. We did the first one already. Time for number two. Last time we went over some basics about cell membrane structure, looked at its components, and what we want to do now is talk about how things get through the cell membrane. Okay, why do you need to move things through the cell membrane? For homeostasis, right? It's all about homeostasis, okay? Got to have the right stuff on the inside, the right stuff on the outside, and to do that, you got to be able to transport stuff in and out. Now, we're going to start by realizing there are two basic types of membrane transport. There is active and there is passive, all right? If a process is active, so in active membrane transport, that means the cell is expending ATP. The cell is using ATP. So the cell is using ATP, using the energy, using the energy from ATP, right? We get energy from ATP. And the cell is using that energy to move something across the cell membrane. Now, if it's passive, you can probably figure this out, right? If it's passive, the cell is not, is not using, not breaking down ATP. So in a passive process, something is moving across the cell membrane, but the cell is not breaking down ATP. That's the big difference right there between active and passive process. Either you use it in active or you don't use it in passive. So we're going to go through both of these types. We are going to see some examples and expand on both of them. All right. Let's make the screen bigger. There we go. I don't know why I didn't do that earlier. It's much better, isn't it? It's fantastic. All right, where was I? Oh, okay. Let's start by checking out my cell membrane right here. Beautiful phospholipids, right? Hydropho hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails, bilayer, of course. I see a pair of integral proteins here as well, transmembrane proteins. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we've got purple circles, orange triangles, and blue circles all entering the cell. All three of them entering the cell. All three of them are going from where there is more. Notice that there's more purple on the outside than in. More orange on the outside than in. More blue on the outside than in. All three of them are going from where there's more to where there's less. What this means it that is that there is a concentration gradient. So the concentration of these things, what color should I use here? Pink? I like pink. The concentration on the outside is high. So there's a high concentration on the outside, and there is a low concentration on the inside. When there is a difference here, when there is a difference between concentration, we call that difference a gradient. That difference is a gradient. And in all three of these situations here, the molecules, the solutes, are going down the gradient. They're going down the concentration gradient. Now, the beautiful thing about going down the concentration gradient, I like to make the analogy that it's like going downhill. So you're on your bike, you're on the top of the hill, and you ride downhill. Do you have to pedal? No, you just go. You just zoom down that hill. You don't have to pedal. You do not have to expend energy. You see where I'm going here, right? You see where I'm going. In all three of these cases, the cell is expending no energy as these things move through the membrane. 
in all three of these cases, these guys are going down the concentration gradient, going downhill. That means they do not need, you know, no energy needs to be expended by the cell. So in all three of these instances, this, these are examples of passive processes because the cell is not expending any, any energy, any ATP energy, because it doesn't need to because we're going down the gradient. All right, real quick before I continue, check out the fact that purple, my purple circle guys, go right through the membrane, whereas my orange and my blue require the help of a protein. What that means is that these purple guys here, these purple guys must be hydro you know the answer? They must be hydrophobic. Only hydrophobic things can zip on through the membrane, which means my blues and my oranges, if they require the assistance of a protein channel or carrier, then these guys must be hydrophilic. I just wanted to point that out because it was just a great example that we had right here. All right, let's check this thing out, okay? Now, we're moving my orange diamonds, or if you tilt your head, my orange squares, and we're moving the, them from where there are fewer to where there are more. So we're, going, we're not going downhill in this case. We're going uphill. We're going up the, whoops, we're going up the gradient. We're going up the gradient. And going up the gradient requires energy. Going uphill requires energy. So you'll notice what is being input to our system here. What is the cell membrane using? The protein in particular is using this molecule of ATP to move these orange diamonds into the cell against the gradient. You can also say against the gradient as well as up the gradient. I like up because it's like uphill. You don't go against the hill, right? Okay, so we establish active process uses energy, ATP. Okay, passive process does not use ATP. If you're not using ATP, you must be going down the gradient. If you are using ATP, you're probably going up the gradient. Makes beautiful sense. All right. So, passive processes, they don't require the cell to expend ATP. Instead, they are driven by the process of diffusion. And I'm willing to bet you talked about diffusion before in like a general bio class, or if you took a chemistry class, of course, maybe you talked about diffusion there, but I bet you talked about it. Diffusion is just all about spreading out things going from a high concentration to a low. So you got to remember, molecules in solution are always moving. Heck, unless we're at like absolute zero, molecules are always moving, okay? Molecules are always moving. They're dancing to the left, they're dancing to the right. So if we have a high concentration on one side and the molecules start to dance, they will just spread out. They will spread out, and that spreading out is diffusion, okay? So you'll put a drop of dye in a beaker, a classic diffusion experiment right here. Put a drop of dye in a beaker, high concentration right there in the drop at time zero, low concentration all around it, but then the dye molecules start to dance around and dance around, and they're more likely to go from where there's a lot to where there's few, then the other way around. And they keep doing this until they're totally spread out. And when they're spread out, they're still dancing. They're still moving. But once you're spread out, every time one moves to the left, another one is probably moving to the right. So passive processes do not require the cell to expend energy. They occur because of diffusion. And diffusion occurs 
because molecules are always moving. There's always molecular movement. And I kind of hinted at why there's molecular movement. It's all about the fact that we've got heat in the system. Unless we're at absolute zero, we've got heat, right? And if we have heat, we have kinetic energy, energy of motion, things are moving. So you heat something up. Diffusion is going to go faster. Heat something up. Diffusion is going to go faster. All right. Fun problems for you to do. Fun problems here. I want you to examine my two beakers. Let me set the stage here. These two beakers are identical in every respect except for temperature, okay? We put a drop of dye in the, the one on the left, a drop of dye in the one on the right. I'm actually going to label them. Let's label them. Um, so we'll call this one A because I'm not very creative. We'll call this one B. So we put the same amount of dye in each beaker. Each beaker had the same amount of liquid in it. Put the same amount of dye in each beaker at the same exact time, but the beakers are at a different temperature. My question for you is, which beaker is colder? Is it beaker A or is it beaker B? And shoot me an email with your answer. And we're actually going to have two questions here, okay? So two extra credit questions here. Um, you're going to email me your answer to both to both questions to me. And of course, remember, you got to email me these things before you take the test. Not at like the end of the semester. All right. Number two. Number two. We have a similar diffusion experiment here. Similar diffusion experiment, okay? So I have a, a dish here, and the dish has this gel in it, okay? And we put a drop of green dye and a drop of red dye in the gel. Same amount of dye. And we put it exactly at the same time. And I want you to tell me which dye do you think is heavier? Oh, yeah. Which one's heavier? Is it number one? Or is it number two? Number one or number two? Which one is heavier? Hmm, we haven't talked about that yet. So, I will let you know that these two dyes are at the same temperature because they're in the same dish. They're in the same dish. They're both at the same temperature, okay? that We're going to establish that as a fact. So, they're at the same temperature. But which one is the heavier one? Is it number one or number two? And I want you to tell me why. Okay? For each of these questions, I want you to tell me why. So which is cold or A or B? Which is heavier, one or two? Shoot me your answer before you take your exam on this stuff. All right, my friends. Let's keep going. Rocking right along. Diffusion is super good at getting things across the cell membrane. Like oxygen diffuses across the cell membrane nicely. Glucose diffuses across that cell membrane nicely. Carbon dioxide diffuses nicely. Um, but there's a problem with diffusion. Diffusion is bad over long distances. This is a heart right here. Doesn't look like a heart, I know. This heart was uh, cut transversely. So if I draw a heart over here, draw a heart over here, bum, bum, bum. gotta get my oracles. Y'all don't know the anatomy of the heart yet, maybe you do. There's my strawberry heart right there. I kind of made it kind of ugly. I have a tendency to make things ugly when I draw. Strawberry heart right there. And this heart was sliced basically right across this way. 
So what kind of slice is that, folks? What kind of slice is that? Is that a frontal slice? Is that a coronal slice? Is that a parasagittal slice, mid-sagittal slice? Is that a ipsilateral slice, contralateral slice? Is it a superficial slice? Is it a peritoneal slice? I'm just giving you crazy options now. The answer is, you're shouting it out at your computer right now, right? Transverse. Other people in your house should hear you like yelling transverse, okay? When you're when you're listening to my my uh, videos here, put your headphones on, but then shout out the answers, okay? Let people know you're working hard. Inspire them. Anyway, this heart was sliced transversely, and this is actually not a good-looking heart. The heart wall is way too thick, and that actually makes it hard for nutrients and oxygen to diffuse to all of the heart muscle cells because the wall has gotten so thick and when things are just diffusing long distances become problematic and in this case the heart may not get enough oxygen to all its heart muscle cells and that's bad um we've actually seen an example of sort of like the reverse of this if you think about lab number three which i know you've looked at by now guarantee you looked at lab number three right now you know that in lab number three we talked about the lung we did because the lung has simple squamous epithelium simple squamous there's my simple squamous cell right there there's another simple squamous cell right there simple squamous cells were super skinny we're super skinny, which is super great for diffusion. I'm trying to draw an alveolus right here. If that word does not ring a bell, you need to go back and review lab number three. Okay, let's keep on going. Boom. There's actually two kinds of diffusion that happen across the cell membrane. There is simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. The difference lies in whether the molecule diffusing has a love for water or a hate for water. So the molecule that's diffusing, whether it loves or hates water, will determine which type of diffusion it will undergo. Do you guys know the word facilitated? Good vocab word right there. I want to facilitate your success in this course. What does that mean? Am I trying to hinder you? Am I trying to obstruct and block you? No, quite the opposite. I am trying to help you. That's why I give you bonus questions. That's why I am available for your questions. I will answer your emails. I will look at your homework if you send it to me early because I want to facilitate your success. All right, let's talk about simple diffusion first. In simple diffusion, the molecule, like this oxygen, this cute little oxygen right here, goes right through the membrane and requires no protein for help. If the molecule doesn't need a protein for help, then it is, it is simple diffusion. So things that undergo simple diffusion include oxygen, Oxygen just goes right through the membrane. By the way, look at all these phospholipids here. Aren't they lovely? Hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails. Beautiful. CO2, diffusing out. And by the way, notice, of course, there's more oxygen on the outside, less oxygen on the inside, so it's diffusing in. More CO2 inside, less CO2 outside, so it diffuses out. And because... These guys are going right through the membrane. We know this is simple diffusion. Hydrophobic stuff, nonpolar stuff, undergoes simple diffusion. So steroids, some favorite steroids we'll encounter in a &P 1 and 2 include estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, so those sex hormones. Also your fat-soluble vitamins. Do you guys know your vitamins? Do you guys know your fat-soluble vitamins? Um, I always remember, I have a mnemonic device for fat-soluble vitamins. I think of a naked person eating vitamins. And the word, whoops, the word naked, I'm going to spell the word naked here. 
The word naked is spelled with a tiny n, and then a big A, a big K, a big E, and a big D. And those four right there, A, K, E, and D, are your fat-soluble vitamins. There is no vitamin N, of course, but it just makes it a nice word. Easier to remember naked than achid, right? Right. Okay, so that's simple diffusion. Pretty straightforward. Facilitated diffusion is when there is a protein that provides help, like a channel protein, as we see here. Here we have an integral transmembrane channel protein right there. He has a passageway through him, and these sodium molecules are diffusing from where there are more of them on the outside, boom, to where there are less of them on the inside. More potassium on the outside, less potassium, sorry, more potassium on the inside, there we go, less potassium on the outside, so potassium diffuses out through this protein. Notice, by the way, these proteins are specialized. This is a sodium leak channel. It allows sodium to go through. This is a potassium leak channel. It allows potassium to go through. So one of the beautiful things about facilitated diffusion is we can be a little bit more selective in terms of what's passing through. And selectivity is going to help us maintain what? Give me that H word. I think it's my favorite 11-letter H word. Homeostasis is the answer. All right, what kind of things are going to diffuse like this? Hydrophilic things, like electrolytes, like glucose. Glucose is a great example as well. We'll actually meet, talk about him in a second. So these things, sodium has that plus charge, potassium has that plus charge that prevents them from going through the fatty interior of the membrane, so they need a protein channel. And please do not forget, sodium rushes in, potassium tends to go out. This will be super important when we start learning how nerve cells work and how they send signals. So don't forget, sodium likes to go in, potassium likes to go out. All right, another type of protein that can be involved in facilitated diffusion is this guy called a carrier protein. Carrier proteins what they basically do, they're still integral transmembrane proteins, but they don't just have a tube in the middle. They actually grab onto the molecule on one side, then they change shape, boom, boom, and spit it out on the other. This is a glucose carrier protein, an essential thing to get glucose into your muscle cells. You do not want glucose just hanging out in your bloodstream all the time. You want to transport that glucose into your muscle cells. So you need these glucose proteins, these glucose carrier proteins. Hey, fun fact. Guess what makes you make more of these glucose carriers? Exercise. The more you exercise... The more of these glucose carrier proteins you make, the easier it is to move glucose out of your blood into the cell. The easier it is to get that glucose, that glucose, I just made up a word, glucose, get that glucose out of your blood. So why is this, why is this good? It, what am I talking about here? What am I, what am I alluding to? This is where I would ask you guys, raise your hand if you knew. And one of you would like, not like 10 of you, would be like, I know what you're talking about, Professor Rumholtz. You are talking about diabetes. And I am. Exercise is a great thing to do. It is going to reduce your risk of developing diabetes. All right. On that note, let's keep going. I want to point something out here. When you are dealing with carrier proteins, you can only have so many, right? There's a finite number of carrier proteins, meaning there's a limit to how many you can have, okay? And what that means is you can only do facilitated diffusion up to a certain rate. All right, there's a rate at which you can't do 
facilitate a diffusion any faster. If you actually look at a graph, if your concentration gradient changes, so like your hill gets steeper, things tend to move into the cell more quickly. This is a beautiful linear relationship for simple diffusion. If you have a bigger gradient, things go into the cell faster. Beautiful linear relationship here. Bigger hill, things, things go into the cell faster. For facilitated diffusion, though, this starts out nice, but then it levels off. Because what happens is you only have so many of these proteins, and they can only work so fast. So they end up getting saturated. So even if I dumped more of these yellow things on the outside, if I only have two carrier proteins, I can only work so fast. All right. Let's keep on going. We're moving, folks. We're flying. I hinted at this earlier, but channels and carriers, one of the things that is fabulous about them is they can be selective. They can be selective. They can let certain things through, but not others. And this is paramount to maintain, shout it out, what is it? Homeostasis. We mentioned earlier, like, you could have potassium channels versus sodium channels. So potassium is bigger than sodium. So we can make the size of the channel matter. We could also make the charge of the channel matter. I can make channels that only let positive ions, cations, through. I can make ones that only let negative anions, anions, through. I could make ones that only let bivalent cations. I'm getting kind of chemistry on you there. But things with a, a double positive charge. Bottom line, we can adjust. Well, not adjust. We can, we can have different proteins that allow different things through. We can have a molecule, a protein that only grabs onto the molecular structure of glucose. It doesn't grab onto the molecular structure of something else. It's beautifully selective, which is beautiful for homeostasis. Okay, we got a special type of diffusion to discuss, and that is osmosis. Osmosis is a diffusion of water through the plasma membrane, through a semi-permeable membrane. I guess you could have osmosis not just in the cell. But for our purposes, it's diffusion of water through the plasma membrane. I got some water molecules, five of them right here. One of my kids once asked me when I was making doing something with this slide, they're like, why do you have so many Mickey Mouse, blue Mickey Mouses on your screen? They kind of look like Mickey Mouse, maybe. Ears, face. But we got five on the outside, three on the inside. So we're going to diffuse in. Small amounts of water can diffuse through the plasma membrane as the phospholipids do their normal dance. Sometimes water molecules can squeak through. But most water molecules, when they diffuse through the membrane, they use a channel protein, this guy right here. He actually has a name. He is called an aquaporin, basically a water hole, right? And this is a fabulous, important protein, fabulously important protein because it's going to help us let the right amount of water into and out of our cells. And of course, that's important for homeostasis. The right amount of water is crucial. It actually helps you maintain the shape of a cell. You get too little water, the cell starts to shrink. Too much water, the cell can get too big, it can even burst. And of course, what depends on shape slash structure? What depends on structure but function? So a lot of important homeostasis going on. Okay, let's look at a laboratory experiment. So I got a U-shaped flask here. Got a semi-permeable membrane down here. I got water on both sides there. And I'm starting out with a lot of sugar on the my right, a lot of not, not a lot of sugar on my left, and the same amount of water. 
Water can go through that membrane, but the sugar cannot. Now look what happens. The water goes from the left side to the right. The water goes from the left side to the right. The reason this is happening is that there is more water on the left than there is on the right. So water will go from where there's more of it to where there's less of it. Now, when we're talking about diffusion of water, though, we normally don't speak of the water, we speak of the solutes. So the water went from where there are fewer solutes to where there are more. Water will always go to where there are more solutes. Water will go to where there's more particles. I like to remember, particles suck. Gotta say it with the exclamation point, too. Particles suck. And what that tells me is water will be quote-unquote sucked. It's not actually sucked. But water will be quote-unquote sucked to the side with more particles. So water goes to where there's more stuff. Okay. One thing we do is we use the process of diffusion of osmosis to describe solutions, okay? So I can describe a solution based on what kind of osmosis it causes with a cell. Does it make water go into a cell, out of a cell, or neither, okay? And there are three possible ways I describe solutions. Solutions can be hypotonic, isotonic, hypertonic. Tonic, in this case, think about the word, like, tone, maybe. The word tone has this idea of stretch. So it's like, less stretch, same stretch, more stretch, okay? That's literally what it means. We might mess with it a little bit to try and help you understand and figure things out. Okay. If my solution is isotonic to my cell, so what we did here is we put a red blood cell into a isotonic solution. Okay? For example, interstitial fluid is usually isotonic to cytosol, to intracellular fluid. That's what cytosol is, remember? So what that means is that the solution concentration of particles of stuff is the same as my cell's concentration of particles of stuff. What that means is there will be no net movement of water because there's no gradient for water. For every water molecule that goes in, a water molecule will go out. And so it is balanced. Water in equals water out. If there's no net movement of water, there is going to be no change. My delta here, delta, Greek letter delta, symbolizes change. There is no change in cell size. So if a solution is isotonic to a cell, that means the cell does not change size. Oftentimes, intravenous fluids are going to be isotonic. So they are not going to cause the change in the cell's size. So even though it doesn't literally mean, it, you mean this, you can think of isotonic as same concentration. So the solution has the same concentration of particles as the cell. All right. Now we have a hypertonic solution. This, good way to think about this, is that the solution has a greater particle concentration. There are more particles outside the cell in the solution than there are inside the cell. Well, if there are more particles outside, and we know particles, quote unquote, suck, then water is going to tend to go out. And if water is going to go out, that means the cell is going to shrink. Look at these shriveled red blood cells here. And if the cell shrinks, the word for that is cronation. Cronation. 
if water leaving is greater than water going in, the cell shrinks, and that happens in a hypertonic solution. Okay, lastly, hypotonic solutions. These are solutions that have a lower concentration of stuff. So this, the solution outside the cell has fewer particles than the cell. You can see that in the artwork here. So more particles in the cell, particles suck. So water has a tendency to go in. More water in than out. The cell gets bigger. There is a ballooning of cells and the potential for lysis which is the bursting of cells. You know, we actually kill bacteria in our body, exploiting this. So let's say you had a bacterium in your body. You actually will make, <clears throat> excuse me, you actually make this set of proteins that's called a a MAC. And this MAC is a set of proteins. And what it does is it punches a hole in the cell membrane. And when this hole gets punched in the cell membrane, water rushes in. And when water rushes in, all the water coming in is going to put pressure on the bacterial cell membrane until eventually the whole thing explodes. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. We're getting up to almost 40 minutes. It's kind of a long one, I know. If I just read these slides to you, we could go a lot faster. Just a thought. Let me know if you want me just to read slides to you. Shoot me an email if that's what you want me to do. What I do want to do right now, though, is discuss what these poor babies are suffering from, which is this condition called kwashiorkor. So what's happening is under severe malnutrition, like say there's, there's a famine, there's just severe, awful malnutrition. When you're not eating enough, especially when you're not eating enough protein, the level of protein in your blood is going to go down. So, that's not good. So, let's say we have a blood vessel, okay? Let me draw a blood vessel here. I'm just going to draw like a little tube. So, I'm drawing a blood capillary there. So, there, there's now, let's say these blue guys are proteins, okay? Because blood protein concentration went down, there's now a lot fewer proteins inside the cell sorry, not inside the cell, inside the blood, let me put a B there for blood, then there is an inter interstitial fluid. So there's more proteins in the tissue fluid than in the bloodstream. So what happens in this case is water leaves the blood. Water leaves the blood and goes to the tissue fluid. And this really happens in the abdominal cavity for some reason. And see so if this buildup of fluid in the abdominal cavity, because the blood protein levels got too low and water got sucked out of the blood. The blood couldn't hold on to it any longer. And so the water moved from the blood to the tissue spaces, especially in the abdomen, also in the feet. We don't see their feet in this picture here, but the, the feet will get swollen too. And this is, this is a real-life example of osmosis in action. I mean, it's where something has gone wrong, but it's osmosis in action. All right. Moving, moving right along. We're done with passive transport. Fantastic. I literally just pumped my fist in the air because we're done with pa uh, passive transport. Now it is time, folks, to finish up quickly to do a couple examples of active transport. We're going to discuss two basic types of active transport. Actually, before we get there, remind me. Active transport, when we have this word active, it means what? It means the cell is using what? Shout it out. Let your 
family, whoever live, whoever you live with. If you live alone, your neighbor, let him hear you. Shout out ATP. The cell is using ATP. And we're going to discuss two types. These aren't the only two types, but they're the only two you and I are going to discuss. Primary active transport and vesicular transport. These are two types of active transport where the cell is utilizing ATP. All right, primary active transport. Check it out. Here's my cell. It's not the very mo- the, you know, like most elaborately drawn cell. This is my cell. Here's the plasma membrane. It's got, it's got a lipid bilayer. Boom, boom. Right here, I got an integral protein, transmembrane protein. And that protein is moving molecule X from the inside. Notice how they made it small on the inside here to represent a low concentration to the outside where it's big to represent a high concentration. So we are moving a molecule up the gradient against the gradient. And that requires energy. And what's happening here is my protein is literally smashing ATP, breaking it down. And as it breaks it down, it is going to remove a phosphate from it, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. When you break it down, you get ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a little phosphate by itself. And that chemical reaction releases energy. And that energy is used to pump molecule X up its gradient and out of the cell in this case. This is an example of primary active transport. Okay. There is actually a very important protein in your cells. Basically, every cell is going to have this protein. Off the top of my head, I cannot think of a cell that does not have this protein. It is called the sodium potassium pump. So named because it moves sodium and potassium through the membrane. What it does, it breaks down a molecule of ATP and it moves three sodiums out and it moves two potassiums, there they are, in. So three sodiums are going to go out and two potassiums are going to go in. This is super important for muscle cells and nerve cells. I know what you're wondering. You're like, why is it important for muscle cells and nerve cells? Well, sodium and potassium both have charges, right? Check. You see that plus sign. And we got three pluses going out and two pluses going in. So this sodium potassium pump makes the inside a little less positive, a little more negative than the outside. So we have an electrical difference. And as you might know, muscle and nerve cells both have electrical properties. Electricity is involved in nerve signaling and muscle contraction. And so the fact that this sodium potassium pump creates this electrical difference is super important. Okay. This pump helps maintain high sodium on the outside, high potassium on the inside. This is also important just to make sure the cell has the right shape. Okay? Sodium is always trying to drift into your cells. And if sodium drifts in, it's going to suck water in, because remember, particles suck, right? And so if we don't pump the sodium out, we'll get too much water inside our cells, and they can start to swell. And we don't want that. Okay, let's keep on moving. Last topic, a few more slides to go. Vesicular transport is when we move large amounts of materials or fluids into or out of the cell with little membrane bags called vesicles. We'll take a peek at one of those bags in a moment. When you're using vesicles to move something out of the cell, that is, of course, going to be exocytosis. 
using vesicles, membranous bags, to move something into the cell, that is going to be endocytosis. All right, let's look at some, let's do some examples. Exocytosis here. So I'm in the cell where my cursor is dancing here on your upper left. There's my beautiful plasma membrane outside the cell over here. This is a vesicle. It's called a secretory vesicle because we're about to secrete something. Secretory vesicle has five red things in it. Notice that the secretory vesicle is made of a lipid bilayer, phospholipids, double bilayer, just like the cell membrane. This is perfection. Notice that there is an integral protein, purple-ish integral protein in the vesicle. There is a pinkish integral protein in the cell membrane. These integral proteins will intertwine their arms. And that pulls the cell membrane right smack dab against the membrane of the vesicle. And if you will recall, membranes like this are fluid and dynamic. So they will not stay separate, but they'll actually merge together. We see they're merging right here. And when they merge together, look in this bottom right-hand corner what has transpired. Now the vesicle has become part of the membrane. And these molecules are free to diffuse away. Because now they're outside the cell. Now, by the way... Notice that when you do this, you make the cell membrane a tiny bit bigger. Well, don't worry. We can run this process in reverse. Imagine if we ran the tape backwards, going from here to here to here to here. We would then bring these red things into the cell. And that's basically what endocytosis is. You run this guy in reverse, you're doing you're more or less doing some endocytosis. So this is a great way we get things out of the cell. All right. That was exo. Let's do two kinds of endocytosis. Receptor-mediated and phagocytosis. Receptor-mediated is where I grab onto specific things with specific receptors. So check it out. We got a cell right here. Beautiful cell. A beautiful cell right here. In that little square we're zooming in. Here's my plasma membrane. In my plasma membrane, we got these yellow receptors. These are integral proteins. They're grabbing the blue guys. Once they grab enough blue guys, the membrane starts to bend inward. Whoopsie. The membrane starts to bend inward. And we're basically doing that exocytosis in reverse. When the membrane has bent inward enough, these two spots right here are going to fuse. And the membrane is going to get pinched off. And we now have a vesicle with the blue guys in there. Don't worry about this word clather in here. It doesn't matter, okay? But this is just a way to specifically bring things into a cell. Okay, phagocytosis is kind of unique. It's done by white blood cells, which are part of your immune system, and done by macrophages, a cell that we met in lab number five, if you've done lab number five already. What macrophages, white blood cells do, is they stick out two membrane arms called pseudopods, false feet, literally, and they stick out two membrane arms around some sort of particle, whether it's something foreign, a dead cell, broken bits of cells. So they stick these arms out, then the two hands will clasp right here, and once the two hands clasp, we will have pinched off a new vesicle with whatever thing we wanted to eat. Phagocytosis, literally, cell eating. And so it is a process where we're reaching out. Now, I do want to point out one thing before I let you go. All of this membrane and vesicle movement requires energy. The cell is using ATP. 
to to stick these arms out, for example, to move those mem- those vesicles. So even though ATP is not pictured here, remember it is being used, and that is why this is active transport. And with that, my friends, we are done with. Lecture topic number two, we finish cells and membranes and transport. Which means next time you and I meet, we'll be doing um, the integumentary system. We'll be doing the skin. Okay, on that note, I will see you folks next time. It's been awesome as always. Bye-bye.